Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to No Food Live. I'm your host, Matthew Lang, and I'm joined by my co-host, Courtney Riggle, sitting here uh, to my side. And we're here to bring you a new series where we dive deep into the world of food informatics and the internet of food. Greetings, we're so pleased to have you join us today. To carry on on the inauguration theme for the week, today is our inaugural episode of No Food Live, which will air on the third Thursday of each month. Today, we welcome Chris Mungle and Damian Dooley, two esteemed ontologists who will help us dive into the world of ontology, knowledge graphs, and how they can be useful for understanding the impact of COVID-19 on our food system. In future episodes, food system data and visualization tools and initiatives connecting data with sustainability development goals. That's right, from earth observation data to molecular components of food and everything in between, we'll cover all aspects of food and food systems informatics. From knowledge graphs for food to Internet of Things for food to ontologies and semantic web components for food necessary to link data sets up, down, and across value chains and cultural systems. But today we're focused on COVID and more specifically how COVID-19 is impacting our food system regarding both availability of food products and ability of people to access food in communities across the world. Early on in the pandemic, we saw acute disease impacts on food system workers, such as meat processing workers, creating bottlenecks in major supply chains, and specific market failures where large volumes of agricultural product like milk and vegetables needed to be destroyed when they couldn't reach their markets on time. We also saw and continue to see increased need for food assistance in all communities and elevated disease rates in frontline food system workers. That's right, Courtney. Even here in Sacramento, California, the self-appointed farm-to-food capital of the United States, we've witnessed family farmers who normally sell their products to restaurants. Many of those restaurants have gone out of business because of the pandemic. Well, these farmers who normally sell to restaurants are now having to plow their crops under because they can't access grocery supply chains. And while this is happening, the food bank lines are getting longer and longer, more Americans are going hungry, and it just doesn't make any sense. COVID-19 has really highlighted uh, for many of us, not just here in this country, but around the world, um, some of the food system fragilities that have resulted um, from the single points of failure that have emerged as a result of centralizing, increasingly centralizing our food system. So in this episode, we're going to take a look at how we can leverage two different technologies, uh, but they're related, ontologies and knowledge graphs so that we can help improve food resilience, food system resilience, uh, relative to food and COVID or, or, you know, basically any pandemic. So let's get started. First up, we have Damian Dooley, a member of the Public Health Informatics Group at Simon Fraser University in Canada. He'll be getting up to, I guess, up to speed on the world's largest and most integrated open food ontology known as Foodon. Damian, can you walk us through quickly, maybe tell us a little bit about what it's for, how it works, and who's involved? I'll also add a reminder for our YouTube audience that we'll be taking live questions throughout. So just type them in. Thanks, Courtney. Yes, I want to introduce Foodon and the Ovo Foundry family of uh, ontologies. And um, I'll explain that um, I, uh, the Public Health Bioinformatics Group at SFU that I work with um, has a group of ontologists uh, supporting this effort and uh, I'd just like to thank Genome Canada and the U.S. Department of Agriculture Agriculture Research Service for being generous funders of the work. So um, I'll explain how we came to this problem which is um, exemplified by this 2011 E. coli epidemic that struck Germany initially and took about two months to solve. 4,000 people fell ill, 47 fatalities, 16 countries and 70 companies. <clears throat> and the problem was traceability. So uh, the ability, the data systems just weren't there to um, go from the outbreak back to the uh, back to the product source. And so Spain was falsely implicated. Um, uh, people were wondering if it was cucumbers or tomatoes or leafy vegetables. It was costing a lot of money, and eventually it was traced back to a single shipment of uh, fenugreek seeds. So fast and accurate detection of pathogens is very critical uh, 
for both health and trade. So, of course, in the last uh, since then, a number of companies have applied blockchain technology to solve this problem, and they are um, working with various actors in the uh, food supply chain to uh, identify packages and individual products as they ship from farm to consumer, they are providing levels of security to enable partners to see various bits and pieces of that information. And they are allowing knowledge uh, to be added on to the ledgers or transactions um, as, as this food travels through the system. So extra knowledge about shelf life and spoilage, authenticity, for the rearing context, whether it's organic food, um, the kind of agricultural uh, context and nutritional content. <clears throat> so the underlying question though is whether this knowledge is queryable and who controls the vocabulary? Uh, so <clears throat> just to um, come back from where we were flying into the problem again, uh, public health agencies are equally interested in this, this information that the blockchain is capable of carrying. Uh, but the agencies themselves have their own siloed databases. Uh, here's CDC Atlanta forms for food interviews to epidemiologists um, asking um, asking outbreak sus um, patients <coughs> about what they ate and where they ate it. BC, CDC, WHO, they all have the same uh, form content um, and yet different databases. So. This problem of vocabulary, shared vocabulary, is something I think that a global vocabulary of food and the knowledge graph um, can come together to solve. But it's going to take um, it's going to take a bit of a mind shift, um, and part of that is avoiding lock-in, avoiding um, depending on the vocabulary of a particular provider. And this involves companies and agencies having to learn to externalize the vocabulary that's in their databases and start to look at their intellectual property as sitting one level above the vocabulary, uh, the business, the unique business rules that uh, they claim for their own need to operate still above the standard vocabulary. So this of course re requires the emergence of vocabulary standards. <clears throat> And that's why I'm selling Obo Foundry, this encyclopedia of ontologies, of which Fudan and a number of related ontologies are a member. So let's talk about that. Obo Foundry has over 50 ontologies in it that um, focus on different domains. So we're talking about chemicals, uh, KEBI, disease ontology, a symptom ontology, the gene ontology. Uh, OB for ontology for biomedical investigations. There's taxonomy, anatomy, all of these um, things that are core to food sciences and to, I mean, um, health sciences and food in particular. And they're ontologies that attempt to be orthogonal to each other, that is, um, housing a single term uh, within the encyclopedia that can be of use to you. That's the objective. And so they're in, organized kind of like an encyclopedia. Um, each, each volume or ontology can be pulled out. <clears throat> and each, critically, each uh, volume of the ontology, each ontology is uh, organized not just by one person or even one organization, but is actually uh, curated in partnership with a variety of organizations. And this um, provides a vitality of expertise, discussing and finessing definitions of terms. And it also provides a wherewithal into the future for, for a particular ontology. The Fudan ecosystem, I like to call it, is all about um, the partner ontologies with Fudan and the underlying ontologies that Fudan relies upon. So this diagram shows the agriculture and the wild food source um, to consumer spectrum with harvested materials and food products in between, and gives you a sample of the Obo Foundry ontologies that are trying to cover this vocabulary space. Uh, so we begin with ENVO, the environment ontology, to talk about field conditions, uh, biomes, agro specializing in farm, uh, processes, 
and methods, farming methods, NCBI taxon for taxonomy, CABI again for chemical contents, nutritional contents of, of uh, organisms and also the environment. Um, the, uh, um, and then on to anatomy, uh, that once you've harvested this, uh, this food material, uh, looking at the different parts of seeds, plants, chicken legs, um, and on to making food products out of these raw ingredients. Then finally, over at the consumer end, we're interested in studying the nutritional uh, component, the impact on particular consumers' tummies and their bio gut biomes, um, nutritional studies around what people are eating, uh, genomic epidemiology studies around infectious disease, so foodborne pathogens. And so food on, uh, of course, relies on the middle layer of them. But what we have um, established in the last year is this joint food ontology work group, which is bringing together curators from a number of these other projects, <clears throat> uh, especially the ones highlighted in blue there, to discuss a diet and nutrition and food terms and synchronize our ontology vocabulary. So just a brief uh, dive into inside food on. Foodon's built on a set of facets um, dating back to another vocabulary, Langual, that um, finessed these for the last 30 years. So we've got packaging, consumer group, part of organism, uh, production environment, the qualities of a food, and all of those um, facets of terminology can be brought together to describe a particular food product. So organic mashed carrot baby food, jarred, has baby as a food consumer, uh, is made of a carrot plant, and specifically the root off the plant. It's got a um, <clears throat> container jar and a consistency of strained. Those are the bag of terms that you can use to apply to describe that food. But, food, uh, but ontologies are bringing a bit more than just that. We're also bringing uh, to the table relations that allow you to connect those bag of terms in particular ways to, uh, a, to a food product. So we're actually talking about a carrot strained baby food product having a quality of strained, having a consumer baby and have, being surrounded by a jar. And that's where the knowledge graph elements come in to provide these little miniature data structure pieces that can become a standard uh, way of describing food products into the future and show up in knowledge, everybody's knowledge graph. So just uh, to sum up, um, food on is mainly a ontology of classes and it's expected that instances of food products are out there in knowledge graphs that can be connected, categorized underneath these classes. And it's made up of uh, chemical food components, over 600, describing nutrients and uh, vitamins and um, food additives. It's got uh, over 3,000 organisms uh, that are the source of plant and animal food, raw foods. We have over 10,000 food products that are related to those plants and animals and over 900 multi-component foods. And finally, um, we also have in food on agency food product types. So EFSA, GS1, their uh, food categorizations, which uh, it will be in the next year a goal for us to map over to the food products uh, in our native food on hierarchy. So um, for more information, see foodon.org. And um, thanks for your time in talking about this. Thanks, Damien. That's really great. Um, you, I, I noticed you had uh, some something about um, the process that foods go through uh, in there. I think it was a couple hundred different uh, terms. Uh, is that something? Uh, it would seem to me that that would be pretty important in terms of um, building out the food ontology. Is that is that an active area of development? It is. Um... We have a partner at uh, UC Davis who's taking a look at, for example, machine learning in order to, uh, in order to come up with the multitude of food processes that are out there. Uh, we have folks at 
the University of Cornell, uh, Cornell University, who are looking at food equipment and they will be coordinating with us on what kinds of processes are associated with what kinds of equipment. Um, and so indeed food on is just separated out food processes so that we can define what the uh, inputs are and the outputs of each process are okay. so that you can start to build up process models. Oh, wow, that's terrific. Okay, great, thanks. Now let's turn to Chris Mungle. Uh, Dr. Chris Mungle is a scientist and department head at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. He's also one of the founders of the Obo Foundry, which we just heard Damien talk about. That's the Open Biological Ontologies Foundry, um, a collection of ontologies to describe all of biology. And he's perhaps the most prolific and cited biological ontologist in the world. We're so lucky to have him here. Um, and lately, uh, Chris, you've been working on an open knowledge graph about COVID, maybe the world's largest knowledge graph about COVID. Um, can you walk us through that, like Damien walked us through, who it's for, what it's about, and how to use it? Sure, yeah, yeah, thank you, Matt, and thanks, Damien, for a great uh, intro there about OBO. So yeah, so I'm gonna talk about um, the COVID knowledge graph we developed at Berkeley Lab um, in my group, but I also really just wanna emphasize this is you know, this work is collaborative, involves, you know, a huge number of people from, you know, uh, institutes not just across the U.S., but internationally as well. Um, and really the reason we built this knowledge graph is that, um, you know, with the outbreak of the pandemic, um, we saw there were just a number of unanswered questions out there, you know, ranging from what kinds of uh, compounds or drugs might target um, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus directly, or interact in some way with its, its viral life cycle or uh, indeed with its uh, disease progression. And understanding this requires a lot of knowledge about the underlying cellular biology of its host, its human, how are the genes and the pathways uh, implicated in both uh, you know, the viral life cycle and also in uh, disease progression. Um, we're also interested in questions like, you know, the host environment, how does that affect disease susceptibility? Maybe even looking forward to uh, pre preventing or being more ready for the, uh, for the next uh, pandemic. Now, uh, the challenge here isn't that we, we don't have sufficient data to answer these questions or sufficient uh, publications uh, describing uh, SARS-CoV-2 and COVID. Really the challenge is that this information is uh, siloed across a number of different databases. It's all fragmented. You could see it as we're trying to build this jigsaw puzzle, not just of SARS-CoV-2, but um, how it kind of like interacts with, um, with wider systems. And there's a lot of knowledge out there in different databases, um, you know, partly curated. There's also information in a non-structured form in the lit literature in the forms of different scientific publications. Yeah. And in fact, you know, we're, we don't even have agreement on how we name uh, all of the different things involved, all of the, the different genes, all of the different uh, symptoms and phenotypes. So it's, you know, you can imagine this is just a big jigsaw that's been kind of like dumped on the floor. And in fact, if we look more broadly um, at, um, at the life sciences and, and data integration, you can think of nature as having this big kind of like Amazon warehouse but whereas in Amazon, I think they have something like 600 million products in their warehouse. Uh, within nature, you know, we have kind of actually like billions, even even trillions of different things. If we look at a number of different named drugs, there's there's something like 10,000 of these, but the wider chemical space is in, in the order of trillions. Uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the human genome has about uh, 20,000 different genes. But if you look across the whole tree of life, you know, there's, you know, you know, even in one database, uh, uh, a Berkeley lab, we've, you know, a microbiome database, you've cataloged about 65 billion different genes. You know, there's millions of uh, variants in the human genome, many of which may have some kind of causative um, role to play in either, either susceptibility to the virus or in disease progression. You know, and there's millions of variants in other genomes as well that may, you know, have some kind of impact on um, zoonotic hosts and so on. So, you know, it's really a huge amount of data. Um, and a huge number of different entities out there. So this is one of the things that drove us to develop um, the what we're thinking what we can think of as the OBO uh, knowledge graph. So Damien gave a great intro to this. Um, and so the basic idea here is that we develop not one ontology but a series of different ontologies for describing and categorizing you know, all of these different um, different kinds of biological entities out there. 
Um, so one of the, the founding members of OBO is a project um, I'm a part of called the, the Gene Ontology, which seeks to describe uh, the, the function of genes, the pathways they're involved with. But it forms part of a network, uh, an interlinked network of other ontologies. Um, these include things like the Uberon Anatomy Ontology, a cell type ontology, an ontology of chemicals and drugs, um, and ontologies that describe uh, both diseases and symptoms of um, um, the symptoms of those diseases. And all of the, the entities in these ontologies are interlinked through uh, different formal relationship types. And this, this pieces together um, really a larger knowledge graph of, of biology. But you know, OBO itself is, is incomplete. It deals with you know, a number of the, the higher level categorizations. Uh, for SARS-CoV-2, we needed to really uh, assemble um, a new knowledge graph, taking um, as part of it uh, selected parts of OBO, also parts of other curated databases, um, and um, also incorporating uh, association, associations mined from the literature. Uh, the end result is what we think of as a comprehensive, high-quality affair that's findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable source of knowledge on entities of relevance uh, to COVID-19. Um, we make weekly releases of the uh, of the knowledge graph. Um, you, know, you can see in the center here, kind of like you know, visualization of all of the different entities and how they are intertwined together, color coded by the uh, the types. And you can see uh, down below. Here's an example of some of the kind of questions that you can ask of this knowledge graph that were not possible to ask of individual knowledge sources because they require linking together uh, knowledge about how different uh, proteins interact with each other within a cell and how drugs interact with those proteins and what the function of those proteins are. So we can ask questions you know, relating to what mechanistic evidence is there to link a drug like uh, Selenex or to uh, viral uh, proteins. So we, we everything is fully open. We can, you can find out more on our GitHub site. Uh, if you want to use it, you might be, go there looking for a nice kind of fancy web portal. Sorry, unfortunately, we don't have that. We don't really have the resources to to build that at the moment. We prefer to spend them more on, um, you know, on the underlying kind of machine learning methods. But you know, if you do want to use it, there is um, for kind of like you know, RDF ontology geeks. We have a Sparkle endpoint. Uh, you can also build uh, a new 4 j graph instance from it. Uh, you can use it with some of uh, with some machine learning frameworks, including. Uh, some frameworks we've developed called Neat and Embiggen, uh, layered on top of uh, Google's TensorFlow framework. And it can also be used embedded within other systems. Uh, and I'll give mention to one of those, which is the uh, National COVID uh, Cohort Collaborative, or N3C. This is uh, an alliance of 56 different in uh, clinical trials, uh, clinical uh, institutes across the US, uh, linking together to share their data. And the COVID knowledge graph is actually deployed within their secure data enclave such that um, people with access can go and kind of explore different hypotheses that link together people's uh, clinical health records, uh, COVID mor morbid morbidity with background knowledge from the knowledge graph to perhaps explore hypotheses about which drugs could be repurposed um, to target um, COVID. And so uh, one of the underlying techniques that we use here is um, a machine learning method called knowledge graph embedding. We've developed some new um, techniques here, a new algorithm called uh, Embiggen. And the basic idea here is that um, really the knowledge graph is, is too big for one person to kind of like explore you know, every possible linkage themselves. So we take that and we embed it in a lower dimensional space. And then you can do things like um, rank potential uh, drug candidates according to how close they are in this latent space um, to, um, to COVID. And I want to emphasize here, the results here are just pure, unvalidated machine learning results at this moment. Please don't try any of these. You know, we don't want any kind of like, uh, you know, fish tank cleaner type, you know, uh, disasters here. So I'm just showing these as, as just general examples of the, um, of the overall framework. We're in the process of validating some of these, some within the, uh, the N3C uh, framework. So really just to sum up, um, you know, as we all know, COVID is a multifaceted phenomena. It requires integrating together, understanding not just of, of the uh, molecular and cellular biology, but also kind of like interlinked systems of the biology of the whole human and you know, how that human uh, interacts with their, with their overall environment. In order to do this, we need uh, not just um, well-curated databases, but ontologies, standards, data models. Uh, knowledge graphs can be used to integrate uh, they're particularly good at integrating this very kind of complex, multi-scale, heterogeneous kinds of data. 
And it's also an ideal framework for applying different techniques, um, different kinds of inference techniques. This goes from kind of classic AI uh, type uh, ontology inference using owl reasoning, as well as more modern uh, machine learning, um, deep learning type approaches. And you know, this all likely um, in some way translates to questions within uh, within the food domain as well, which is itself very kind of like you know uh, complex, holistic, and uh, heterogeneous. And so you can find out more on our website here. And I guess I'll leave it at this, and we can take uh, take any questions. That's that's great. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, so uh, I guess my my first question is for you, Damien. Um, Given what we just heard from Chris, uh, and you started with uh, some forms from uh, CDC and whatnot for, for tracking foodborne outbreaks. So uh, what's what do we need? What do we need to, to link up food information and, um, and COVID information so that um, if the next pandemic is maybe not spread by air, but spread through a food supply chain. Um, uh, how how can we how can that be solved? What 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 do we need to do there? Yeah, so I think the technology is rolling along. People are starting to figure out how to stuff knowledge into knowledge graphs. Um, I'd say it's almost more of an institutional question. All of this ontology stuff has basically been powered by academia and it's now starting to move out into industry and government. So I would say what's really needed is uh, training and uh, training. So that's why Foodon, for example, is really starting to benefit from having curators who are representing other agencies in government. So the US Department of Agriculture and some of the other food safety agencies, FDA, we're now both educating how to use ontologies, get them in at that lower level in the database systems, and um, getting to that level of confidence where now the in-house staff can actually say, yes, let's take this, I love it, let's put it into our own databases. And once that's achieved, you, you've got that um, chain reaction of standardization happening, um, de facto standards, basically Obo Foundry. It's kind of like a de facto standard that's making its way into different ISO efforts too, so. And, and I guess the same question to you, Chris, but do you see a need for, you know, um, what can be done at a, at a biomolecular level? Since that seems to be the, where you operate as uh, most. Um, do you, do you have any thoughts about how these two might might come together to prevent a future pandemic, perhaps before, so we don't have to go through this economic strike? Yeah, I mean, I I wouldn't want to make any kind of like bold claims about being able to prevent a, a future academic, but you really just to yeah emphasize what what Damien says as well uh, the importance of kind of open standards like um, the Open Foundry here and open data as well. Um, you know, that's open data is maybe not always always possible within, you know, within the uh, biomedical sciences. Obviously, um, we have PHI data about humans and so on. There may be also kind of like yeah, challenges in making data open when it comes to things like um, food supply as well. But um, insofar as, you know, we can have kind of like, you know, have the data be as open as possible, have it be kind of like accessible using kind of fair mechanisms and, you know, have it follow standards such that you know these databases aren't siloed together, but they can be they can be interlinked via, via complex queries that allow you to kind of explore, um, you know, whether there's some kind of kind of connection between something that's happening at the at the broader kind of geographic scale and something that may be observed more at the at the more kind of like you know human health or even kind of like molecular or cellular scale. Right, right. I I just like to take a moment to remind our um, uh, YouTube uh, watchers and listeners uh, that they can type right into the YouTube comment section uh, any questions they may have for our guests here. I guess I'd add as well, there's a big impetus now to do uh, text mining on papers to uh, automatically understand since the volume of of academic papers is far greater than any human can understand. There's a, there's big impetus to text mine, at least four different projects working to text mine COVID-19 literature. 
And so part of that is getting all the synonymy down um, and using Obo Foundry family of vocabularies to um, uh, to tag those papers, semantic content, at least at the word and phrase level. But beyond that, we need to develop uh, models, uh, epidemiology, in the case of epidemiology, the who, what, why, where, how, when model, um, and encode that as well in ontology. So it's kind of like in our, in my public health uh, bioinformatics lab, what drove us into food on was uh, needing that global vocabulary across agencies for food. Um, but the second level now is to develop ontology driven models of disease so that we can actually tag those papers even more intelligently than just at the uh, right so level. let me let me let me jump in there um because i think you're saying something and we didn't really cover this um but it, it seems to me that there's there's a couple different sort of ways of how we got here and um so i'm gonna sort of jump in and and, and maybe characterize this for our um, our audience. Um, so on the one hand, we have relational databases, sort of the standard databases that are in government and industry, um, arguably, you know, greater than 90% of the databases that are out there are probably relational in structure, tabular in structure with columns and rows linked together with primary IDs. Um, so one way we can use these ontologies would be to make sure that the terms that are in those definitions or even the column headers that are in those relational databases uh, are ontology terms or at least linked to ontology terms. Um, but what you just mentioned, Damien, which I think is, is an important thing to, to remember is you, you talked about natural language processing. And so what we're really doing is looking at a body of literature, an article uh, say, um, and pulling out specific entities that are in that literature. So whether it's a protein or a gene or an ingredient or a food um, or a food process, pulling those entity co concepts out and then linking them to each other based on the words that are in the sentences. Is that is that correct? Yep, and not making the basic mistake which low level uh, text mining does, um, <laughs> which is if you run into a sentence that says, this paper is not about COVID-19, it gets tagged as a paper about COVID-19 because it's just spot. Right, right, because they haven't uh, put in the proper um, uh, algorithms to uh, read the linkages yeah. about the terms. Yep. Yeah. yeah, even just that challenge of um, being able to automatically rank the relevance of, of a paper to a particular topic like COVID-19 is, you know, is, is challenging. I want to plug out another project at Berkeley Lab here called uh, COVID Scholar uh, that provides a really nice kind of interface onto um, a set of relevancy ranked uh, articles about, about COVID. Uh, the technology, I think, is you know, probably quite applicable to other domains like, like food as well. But also just to, you know, just to emphasize as well, going beyond simply being able to detect uh, the names of entities in, in the papers, which itself is enough of a challenge because even within uh, SARS-CoV-2, I mean, there's a handful of kind of genetic elements here, like, you know, a, a two dozen or so. And in fact, there wasn't really kind of like standards for actually how to refer to these, these different genes and people refer to them in different ways. And one of the things we actually had to do as part of our, our COVID knowledge graph is go back and kind of recurate all of the different identifiers and names for which these uh, genetic elements were used. But really you have to go beyond just being able to detect the entities in the text themselves and to be able to extract relationships to see um, how these different entities you know, relate to one another, whether, to, whether, whether a particular uh, uh, gene in the, in the SARS-CoV-2 genome is targeted by a particular drug, what its effect is on a particular disease and so on. Right. So and we're that, also, oh, go ahead, Courtney. Well, I want to I want to kind of switch back to COVID impact on the food system in a second. But if you want to have another question or two in this direction, let's do those first. Uh, yeah. Well, let me let me just um, before you before you change directions here, uh, we have a question from the audience, and I think it it, it relates to um, to another question that I had in mind. So let me sneak this in because it's relating to this at the molecular level. I'll just put it up on the screen here. It's from Benay Dara Abrams. Is there any way food ontologies can be used to help people with smell and taste disorders due to COVID-19? Um, perhaps maybe linking some of these biological processes. And I'll just put this out there uh, to go with it uh, to ask you, um, 
uh, if either of you, uh, maybe um, uh, you could take a shot at this, Damien, um, first. But um, how far are we uh, from having knowledge graphs where we can uh, enable precision foods, uh, personalized nutrition, biology? Um, what, what do we need to do to get there? Mm -hmm. And it, I think it goes with, with, with what this is, uh, being personalized and precise in terms of um, uh, foods. Right. Well, that reminds me of a project you were involved in at UC Davis, <laughs> organoleptic uh, uh, vocabulary for describing food. And I remember uh, uh, visiting and being given a lecture about um, a fellow who was studying uh, airline foods at high altitude and, and people not being able to taste salt and so adding more salt to them or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. So we need a vocabulary in place, but I think it's really food science that you'd have to turn to um, uh, for answers there, but uh, maybe this circles back to um, having the, the ability to tag the papers that are relevant to the subject with the vocabulary. So Chris, in your knowledge graph, does the, um, does the COVID knowledge graph that you have include uh, papers that have talked about uh, anosmia or um, loss of taste due to COVID? Um, it does indeed, yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I could certainly say in answer to the question, it's possible. I don't know how likely it is, but um, just to kind of give you a sense of how these things link together, um, anosmia is it's already a term in the human phenotype ontology, and that term has been used to link, uh, to annotate a number of other different diseases, you know, ostensibly diseases that are nothing to do with uh, SARS-CoV-2. Maybe there are some features in common between those diseases. Maybe, maybe there are kind of like treatments known for some of these diseases that could be brought to bear, you know, with um, on a, as anosmia here. Um, yeah, I want to qualify that and say it's, it's, it's certainly possible, but, you know, I, I have no idea of, of how likely that, that actually is. So let's, I, you know, I want, I want this, this series really to be where we're not afraid to try to uh, hypothesize live in front of an audience, you know, uh, group think, uh, come up with ideas. Um, I'm just thinking about this this question that that Benet has asked us, and what what would we need? We would we would need um, we would need to know specifics about the disease, perhaps um, maybe even some more specifics about which uh, particular odors can't be smelled. If it's all odors, or if it's just a few odors, or which receptors would be involved in sensing those specific odors. Um, and we can say the same thing with, with tastes and tastants, tastants being the molecules that give rise to, to taste. Um, mm -hmm. and I, I, would, I would add to that the, the biological pathways, the signaling pathways that those receptors are involved in. You know, maybe, maybe the receptors are, are perfectly fine in this case, but there right. is some downstream signaling um, error. There's something kind of interrupting that pathway. Um, yeah. Right. So these all need to, to be Good brought point. to bear as well. Mm -hmm. Good point. <laughs> There's probably um, a bit of a, an angle as well on um, food analogs. So if something, if you can't taste something, can it be swapped out for something else you can taste? And uh, so food on has just had a small analog um, annotations put in, but we can see that part greatly advanced in, in the ontology too. Great. And, and I, I guess I would add one more aspect to that, which would be then, um, uh, whatever uh, tastant or odorant um, was being presented to someone who was being tested for something like this, um, we would probably uh, want to know if there was um, a concentration level variance uh, uh, in terms of, um, so that would be at the receptor level. Um, but, but Chris, I like your, your mode of thinking there that, that also it, it could be something interrupted um, in the transmission from from the receptor, which could be working fine, uh, into the brain or or back out uh, into um, how we actually perceive that. Um, so it may not actually the the, the route in uh, may be fine, but the route out uh, uh, into our perception of of what it is uh, may actually be disrupted. And from an epidemiology perspective, we want to know that people either are recovering from that eventually, in which case maybe it's not quite so much a problem or if they aren't, if there's a permanent issue that 
really uh, garners uh, epidemiology attention. So perhaps, um, you know, we don't, we don't really have ways for people to really record um, whether they feel like they're losing their sense of taste or smell uh, in the same way that we have vision tests, you know, um, you can go and get tested regularly for these things, but I can't go to the um, flavor optimist and, um, and, and get tested for, for uh, smells and tastes in the same way that I can go to the optometrist and, and get my eyes checked or the audiologist and get my ears checked. So perhaps that's, that's something that we should actually consider as, a, as an important uh, characteristic for um, surveying uh, the health of people. Courtney, I'm sorry, I, I, I went down a jag and I, I uh, interrupted you, but you were going to ask a, a, a different line of questions. Yeah, so this is kind of a 180. We've been looking at kind of the micro part of, of especially individuals and, and their uh, their food response to COVID, their the bio epidemiological pieces. But to, to come back to the macro food system level, which we kind of framed it as, as the macro level when we started the show today, which was, you know, supply chains and um, and impacts on agricultural production and access to food. So just looking at, at what we've talked about today, it looks like we have a lot of institutional knowledge and work that has gone into some really important building blocks to be able to help describe and understand that larger picture. And so granted, this is pushing out of your wheelhouse a little bit, but I'm projecting like, how can we use our knowledge of the disease and the impacts on people, our knowledge of food, food production, and some of those supply chain pieces, how can we pull those together to be maybe a little more predictive? I know we're missing that um, human actor social element part of this conversation right now, which actually we'll be talking about in our show next month when we have uh, a kind of a, a more uh, bigger picture conversation. So. Um, the food system solve at Davis is working on that that human piece, which will come in. But what are the missing pieces to be able to kind of pull a lot of these important building blocks together to help us be a little more predictive or responsive on some of these bigger picture issues on um, on you know when you have major epidemiological epidemiological outbreaks and we start to see ripples on on the human effects, um, you know how is that impacting the the food supply chain so can we connect these together to see more of the the bigger picture and what are the missing pieces we need to do that so let me start uh, damien why don't you i know that's that's a big push but yeah. <laughs> um, what do you see what do we need to do first it's such a big question and it's at all ends of the spectrum so in agriculture usda uh, Agriculture Research Service, their focus is on trying to get a better understanding of the nutritional content of tested foods and the regional variation of those. So that's sort of their, their commitment to public health is to make sure people are well fed, um, not quantity of food, but nutrition. And uh, so they're just starting to introduce ontology in and knowledge graph, actually, if you go to the uh, USDA's FDC website right now, Food Data Central, that's a graph-driven database. Um, one of the first that a, a government has actually, um, American government has actually put on online. Um, so their next stage is to provide much more granularity using ontology facets to describe the uh, the, um, the tested foods that they've got um, from around America and around the world for nutritional content. <clears throat> so that's one end of the spectrum, the ag, agriculture end. Then <clears throat> over on the far end, the consumer end, uh, more into the sociological is um, dietary studies, surveys. What are people actually eating and how can we motivate them, make it convenient to eat? better. So that is also an area. A couple of ontologies have popped up to try to support that end, describing dietary terms and uh, surveys in the last year, part of our, our joint food consortium to, to tackle that. In terms of knowledge graph, of course, we, we, we just want all these databases to be able to be compatible so you can throw them in and then run queries on them all. But to do that, we've got to get the ontologies in place. 
and, and the data in graph form. Yeah, and and I think maybe as, as well, just you know, again, just to so sort of go back to a previous point about open open data for you know, particularly at the level of kind of individuals, and, and maybe we want to kind of push another standard that we've been kind of working on um, more in a kind of like a genomics and health context. It's called a Pinot packet, and the idea is it's an open standard for people to be able to kind of like record um, and share data that they're willing to share about their own kind of like um, their own health, their own, their own phenotypes um, and so on. And really the standard is designed in such a way that it can be it can be kind of extended and you can maybe add to your phenotype packet kind of like, you know, information about your different kind of like exposures, you know, different kind of like, you know, drugs you've taken or kind of maybe even different kinds of kinds of foods that you you have taken. And the idea is that you can kind of take ownership of this and kind of like share this, you know, with with kind of researchers at that level at which you are you're comfortable. So again, that's Sanders called a uh, phenotype packet and it's part of the uh, Global Alliance for uh, Genomes and, and Health. That's that's really really interesting. I'm, I want to uh, I want to sort of follow up on that point that pheno packet. Um, so this is I guess you would say sort of a structured or structurable quantified self kind of thing. Exactly. That? Yeah. 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 That's a much better description of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Terrific. Um, uh, like like the whole quantified self thing, and I'm glad to see some structure coming around it. Uh, I think that's that's been necessary. Um, I'm curious uh, whether uh, you have um, uh, dietary components in there, and um, whether you're linking to to food on, uh, and to 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 uh, characterize people's diets. The, there is not at the moment. I think the original scope was much more kind of expansive. Um, currently, we are you know the main use cases for it are more um, to do with you know. Um, People with kind of like chronic diseases, or with uh, with rare or genetic diseases, yeah. or with cancer and so on. But the overall framework was designed with that kind of extensibility in mind, um, and that is definitely a direction you know we'd like to to go with. Well, I, I hope you've reached out to Sharon Terry at the Alliance for Genetic Support Groups. Um, um, I have not, but I believe you know the part. You know, I should really kind of credit you know one of the the main people behind this is kind of your colleague and mine, uh, Melissa Handel, who yeah. also runs the the N three C, and I believe she she is indeed in contact with uh, Sharon. Oh, that's that's fantastic, and and I'm sure they'll yeah. they'll uh, mm -hmm. they'll hit it off as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just to talk about uh, fair fair data, um, there's a project. One of the ontologies on to hold. One ontology for nutritional epidemiology. Their goal is to uh, standardize the description of nutritional studies, and that means um, that means surveys like the WIWA, what we eat in America, that comes out every two years. And so they're uh, they're actually adding terms right now to Ogo Foundry to describe the metadata of those studies, and then get down to the question level, so that finally that kind of information can be exposed in a in a knowledge graph fashion. Right. Great. Um, wow. Well, what a what a great discussion, and um, I'm just thrilled to have you guys here. We, I feel so lucky. Um, so, if we were to to say, you know, um, two years, five years, ten years, Damien, um, with food on, and um, what would you? Where would you like to see us in, in those milestones, and what do, what do you think is possible? Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to take a few years to get um, staff familiarized with ontologies uh, through European and North American infrastructure. Um, it's happening right now. Standards are now being backed up. Um, genomic standards, um, EFSA, European Food and Safety Administration is now examining uh, which ontologies to use. They're actually in the selection process for um, for food risk assessment. <clears throat> so, so many agencies have, have now, in the last two years, actually remarkable changes in the last two years uh, in terms of not just interest, but effort to adopt by creating work groups inside organizations. So that'll continue. Mm -hmm. and it's a little bit of um, evolutionary warfare, <laughs> Darwinian survival of the fittest in the in the non uh, in the non uh, in, in, a, in a 
well, whatever the word is for a slightly more hostile uh, <laughs> existence. So I'm, look at it for, I'm sorry, I, I, I don't understand. Where, where, where is I, I, I'm pointing around to that um, now we have to see which ontologies survive. Um, we've got Obo, we've got the uh, bioportal um, list of many, many, many ontologies, but not all of them are compatible, and a number of them are drifting, ghosting ships, ghost ships. So right. we actually really have to focus on uh, ontologies that will that can be supported in this fair data way. Right, and so Chris, this is this is what the Obo Foundry is about, right? I mean, this is why you yeah. developed the Obo Foundry so that these standards so that these ontologies can essentially use each other's terms, talk to each other. Can you say exactly. a little bit yeah, more yeah. about that? And, 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 and I would say it's less of a Darwinian struggle and it's more of a framework for different kind of like uh, vocabularies, ontologies that are maybe originally overlapping to kind of come together into into a shared um, a shared ontology. And often this is as sociological as much as is, is technical. So, you know, an example here is kind of we we built this um, multi-species anatomy ontology called Uberon. Right. This is you know it has kind of like you know, tentacles from an octopus as well as all the all the all the, you know, all the different parts of your brain, the different parts of animals you may or may not like to eat, and so on. Um, <laughs> and originally there was like you know you know there was like dozens of different kind of vocabularies in the space, and people thought, well, there's no way we can possibly even the people doing the human ones thought they couldn't work together. Never mind the people working on kind of like you know other vertebrates like a fish. But right. in actual fact, you know, we we had a kind of like series of meetings and we kind of like demonstrated that, you know, you could actually have one single framework that allowed you to kind of like have a common representation that allowed you to do the specific things that people need to do if they're doing more clinical focus research. We even brought together kind of like dinosaur researchers who needed to be able to describe the different bones of a Tyrannosaurus rex. And we all, yeah, managed to use the same, the same ontology at the end of the day. It was a, you know, a lot of, a lot of work and a, a lot of meetings and a lot of kind of like you know ontology and engineering expertise, but this is this is exactly the kind of thing that, that Obo is here for to provide this kind of like you know uh, social and technical forum for for groups to come together and work towards common solutions because often at the end of the day it's it's less expensive than having multiple different competing solutions that need to be uh, all mapped together. Right. You know, all of the attendant problems there. Well, that's what I mean, actually, that those standalone ontologies, if they don't really focus on interoperability, will in the end be kind of the islands or silos. Right. Great. Well, um, that's terrific. Uh, Courtney, you're muted. Sorry about that. So how much of this integration process when we're aligning these different ontologies, how much of that is um, human investment and how much can be using AI tools to help with that process? And I, I guess say, to Chris first on that one. Our process ontology discussion, which is happening. Oh, sorry. Well, I'll just say our oh, process, ahead, ontology, <laughs> which is happening right now um, with uh, USDA and, and a few other people, um, is focused on manually defining the top level uh, distinctions. And then we're turning, looking to researchers for machine learning to actually be able to compile um, the underlying uh, processes from literature out in the world. Yeah, I think ultimately it has to be some kind of combination of, of the two. Um, and, you know, I would here, you know, I would draw a distinction between the kind of ontology itself, which is you know, largely manually created. You know, you can, of course, you make use of kind of like, you know, well-known technologies like our reasoning to kind of help you automatically construct the ontology um, based on kind of like prior knowledge that you encode yourself. Uh, but sometimes in order to populate that ontology is just too much work for one one human. And this is where techniques such as natural language processing, you know, which has really advanced a lot in the last few years with these new language transformer models and so on. Um, they can de definitely be used to help populate instances of the ontology at a very broad level, but it's it's very domain dependent as well. I mean, even just named entity recognition can be, you know, an immense challenge when it comes to actually trying to uh, figure out which which biological processes um, and uh, a scientist is talking about in in the literature. So there will you know there even the automated techniques rely to a massive extent on a large body a, a gold standard well curated uh, benchmark as well. 
just in case some folks are wondering why ontologies are, are being, why we're promoting them for knowledge graphs, it's because the actual relations that ontologies define as connecting between terms can be reused as actual knowledge graph relations. Um, it's the, the ontology is providing the language to construct the knowledge graph with. So it's the, yeah, it's the, it's the vocabularies and their relations to each other that provide essentially the skeleton um, for the data meet. Yeah. <laughs> is, is that a That's fair so characterization? I think so. Yeah. And the boundary can often be fuzzy. You know, you can get, we can get into kind of, you know, um, you know, deep discussions in rabbit holes about what the actual definition of an ontology is and where an ontology ends and a knowledge graph starts or a database starts and so on. But uh, these things all kind of like you know, blend together at, at some at some level. Mm -hmm. So you can't really separate them. They're interlinked. So just mm -hmm. how they are. <laughs> um, wow. Well, um, it looks like we're just about out of time. So um, I, uh, I'd, I'd like to say thank you, Chris. Uh, Chris Gandalf Mungle. <laughs> The Wizard of Un you've, you've grown your beard out now. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I don't have my wizard hat right now. But um, yeah, you don't you don't have your hat on right now. But um, but you are the the Wizard of on that, that's your preferred term, right? Wizard. <laughs> <laughs> that's we need a we need an ontology of ontologists, and <laughs> and um, <laughs> uh, so no, really, um, thank you both very very much uh, for for participating. And um, Courtney, did you uh, uh, have, um, you've got some details about our next episode. I do, let me make sure I get them all correct here. So third Thursday of every month, next month, we are talking about, uh, I know what we're talking about, what, value chains and looking at local to global, local to global, if I can speak, food system knowledge integration and visualization. Our guests will be Tom Tomich from the UC Davis Food Systems Lab, Jessica Fanzo from John Hopkins University, where she's uh, helped lead the development of the um, food system dashboard, and Andre LaPeria from Godan, who many ontologists are well familiar with, and we're very excited to have us join them, have them join us next month on February 18th. Um, anything else you want to add, Matthew? No, uh, no, I think that's great. And um, just say thanks again. And thanks to our audience for tuning in and asking such great questions. And um, we'll see you all in a month. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much. Bye. 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 Thank you both. Yeah. Bye. Okay. I appreciate it.